2018, the National Council of Public History had its conference in uh, annual conference in Hartford, Connecticut. And the keynote, uh, well, the, the opening talk, sorry, was given by the mayor of the city. And he confessed that he didn't know what public history was, but because he was invited for a public history conference, what he did was to Google public history. And what he found on Google was the website of the NCPH, of the National Council on Public History. So he clicked on the website and the first thing he, he, he reads in the definition was that uh, public history is like pornography. You know it when you see it. And he said that <laughs> he was very confused by that, you know, comparing uh, public history to pornography. You know it when you see it. Uh, and, and you know the audience was was laughing, and it was a bit embarrassing for you know for for discussion on what public history is. And I I argue that no, public history is not like pornography. You don't know it when you see it. You you need some definitions of public history. You have definitions of our history. You have definitions of cultural history. Why not having a definition of public history? But having said that, it, it's very critical to, uh, to it's, it's very easy to be critical towards a definition. This definition is not good enough. Uh, it's way more difficult to one definition of public history. And we can even wonder, do we need one definition of public history? It's, it's a controversial uh, subject. For example, in uh, 2007, the National Council of Public History tried to give a new definition of public history. And they proposed, and I quote, uh, public history is a movement, methodology, and approach that promotes the collaborative study and practice of history. Its practitioners embrace a mission to make their special insight accessible and useful to the public. And this, and in particular the term mission, created a huge controversy controversy in the US because a lot of historians, they don't have a mission to bring knowledge to the people, which is a very hierarchical way of thinking about your role. For many historians, they want to share, they want to work with, they don't have a mission. So that's only an example to, to tell you how difficult it is to create one definition uh, for public history. So what do we do? Some people uh, have used metaphors to define uh, public history. And I want to give a few examples of metaphors that have been used. One very famous one is uh, from uh, Ludmila Jordanova in her book, History in Practice, where she compares public history as an umbrella, right? Public history is an umbrella. You have here uh, an image about social science as an umbrella, uh, so that gathers different fields. So public history would be umbrella that gathers different practices. Okay, fair enough. That's one metaphor to define uh, public history. Other people uh, have compared public history to a big tent. For example, Jennifer Dickey in, in, uh, in 2018 compared public history as the big tent. And this expression of the big tent comes from actually the digital humanity. Uh, from 2011, the conference when they compared digital humanities to a big tent. The process is the same. You have a tent that gathers different practices and field. So public history would be a big tent. Okay. Someone uh, that you all know, Marcel Raveduto, proposed something different. In, in the book uh, from, uh, I mean, edited by, by uh, Paolo Farnetti, Lorenzo Bertuccelli, and Alfonso Botti, uh, Marcello wrote a, a chapter called Il viaggio della storia dalla terra ferma all'archipelago. And um, I, I believe, and Marcello tell me, tell me if I'm right, if I'm wrong, uh, that in that metaphor, public history is an archipelago. It's made of different islands, right? Different practices. They are distinct, they're different, but they're connected to each other by the sea. So there's already something different here different practices, but connected by something, the fee. And I, I like that metaphor, and I would like to expand on, on that one. I think it's a very good uh, way to conceive public history. So metaphors, and you know, some people do not like metaphors. 
Some people think like, uh, for example, Marco Demontowski, who published Public History in School. In his introduction, Marco uh, says that actually metaphors are just weak definitions. They are not really definitions, they are, you know, metaphors, which is not exactly the same. So instead of a metaphor, uh, Marco present that uh, scheme that you see on the left, saying that metaphor are not good enough, that we need a strong definition. I would tend to disagree with, with Marco uh, for, for some reasons. I, I still think that um, metaphors are useful. Metaphors are useful because they are introduction, right? They may not be theoretical definition, but they are introductory steps. They can spark discussion. When you, when you see a metaphor of the umbrella, of the archipelago, or the one I will use right after, you, you create discussion, right? Uh, that can lead to further theories. And, and the umbrella, the archipelago, they translate, um, you know, a, a definition of public history as a fragmented field. So it's fragmented, but it's united by something. It's united by a common understanding of history. So you, you do have a sort of understanding of history in the metaphors. Um, I think we can go even further um, on what Mar uh, Marcello calls the C, the connection between the different practices. What unites the different practices in public history? So I was thinking about Marcello's uh, metaphor and uh, I tried mine. I, I proposed a new uh, metaphor of public history that Marcello knows about that I would like to uh, discuss. So I compare public history to a tree with the play word uh, public is tree. Uh, that doesn't work in Italian or in French, but it, it does in, in English. So I, I want to give you just uh, a few seconds to look at, at the tree because I'm going to talk about difficult different parts of the tree. So I give you a few seconds. Uh, it allows me to, uh, to drink something. So the, the tree, um, what is in that tree? Um, the tree is, compo is composed of uh, four parts. Uh, the roots, the trunk, the branches, and the leaves. And I, I, I use that tree because it helps me to visualize what public history is. And it has some flaws, it has some disadvantages, some caveats, but I, I still uh, like to use that, that metaphor of the tree. Why? So let's, let's look at the, the tree. Uh, the roots at the bottom of the, of the slide um, are the creation of sources, the creation or the preservation of sources. So you talk about archiving, you talk about uh, museums collecting objects, you talk about preserving buildings, you talk about digital born uh, archives or history. So that's the creation of archives. The trunk, so the, the middle part, is perhaps the most uh, traditional activity for historians. The trunk is interpreting the sources. So uh, writing history from uh, sources. After the trunk or you know, above the trunk, you have branches. And branches are the different ways you can communicate uh, history. So you see, for example, video games on the right. You see blogs, you see books, obviously. Um, you see TV, fiction, radio, reenactment, school. So you have multiple branches that are the multiple ways you can communicate history. And uh, I, I like the tree because it helps me to show, especially students, that books and articles are by no way the only way, the only means you can communicate history, right? You can use blogs, you can use tour, so you have a multiple of ways to communicate history. Above the, the branches, you have the leaves, uh, and the leaves are the different uses of history. So you have history used in education, top right, or you have uh, history used for fun, for tourism, for marketing, for
it seems that someone muted me uh, in the meeting. So can you can you hear me now? Si, si, si. Okay. Bene. okay. Bene. Um, so you have different uh, uses of history. And I, 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 I like that that tree also, you know, it, it has some some you know caveats. They have some problems. I don't, for example, um, intend. I don't want to say that you know there is a creation from bottom to up. I don't want to say that it's a straight path. What I want to say it's like it's like an ecosystem. The tree is an ecosystem. All parts are connected. It means that public history. You need a trunk. You need historical understanding analysis of sources. So you need that trunk in public history, but you also need the branches. So it's not uh, it's not enough to interpret sources. You need to communicate sources, right? It means that in public history, it's not only historians. In public history, you may have tour guides that will communicate the history made in the trunk. It means that you have archivists that are going to collect archives and create archives. So you have multiple actors in public history. It also means that historians can take part in the four aspects, in the truck, trunk, sorry, obviously, but also in the communication, also in the creation of archives. It helps me to show that public history is a broader definition of making history. It's not only using and interpreting sources. Communication is part of public history. So from uh, from from that uh, metaphor, I I think I touch upon the glue or what Marcello calls the C between the different practices, right? Because you you have uh, a process of doing history. I like to compare the tree to a process. We make public history with different steps. So this this was the first part of my of my presentation. I would say the the easy part. Uh, because that's the part I, I, I know the most about, it coming from me, so I, I know about it. The second part is way more difficult for me, uh, because, let me move. The second part um, is about all the difficult, I mean all, lots of difficult questions I received during uh, the, the last 10 years about public history, the difficult questions I heard, uh, from 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 panels, from conferences, from curators, from students, and you only have a few of them. Um, can give you a minute to to look at the different um, difficult questions that I receive, and I, I wanted in the second part of the talk to take some risk um, because I, I don't have the answers for all those questions, but I believe those are very important issues we need to talk about in public history. I think now we, we have worked and at the international public history, we have conference events. I think it's time to work on the core issues of public history. Uh, as, as I send the slide to, to spice things up, to talk about a challenging aspect. And just to, to acknowledge that it's, it's a work in progress, right? Um, I acknowledge that it's not definite. It's only some uh, some answers about difficult questions. So stay with me in the sense that you know I want to create discussion. I don't pretend to have all the answers at all. So the way I, I designed the second part of the, the talk is to start with criticism that were given to public history or how I was criticized by by colleagues. Uh, by partners, by, by people uh, about public history. So I designed it by a list of questions or criticism that I want to try to answer. And I will start from the, well, the easiest to the toughest. Uh, the, the first one, the first question or criticism uh, was not towards me, it was towards public history. It was a, a, a question criticism by a, an Irish historian who said that uh, a few years ago, there is no need for public history because we already have it, right? Uh, and his argument that you can see on the left hand side was that um, all historians have a public, right? 
There is no such thing as a Ivory Tower. All East Orleans have a public. He was also saying that lots of Irish historians write in newspapers, they are on radio, they are on TV, uh, they write popular books. So he was saying, well, there, there's no need for public history. There is no need for a new field. We are already doing it. He was saying that people would, you know, want to defend public history, just want to create a niche to get jobs or they want to promote themselves. Um, so my, my answer um, is that I, I would agree that all East Orleans have a public, you know, even if two people read your article, it's a public, right? So, so the, 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 the symbol of the Ivory Tower is, is misleading, right? It's not like public history is public and academic history is not public, right? The question is more what publics do we have, right? So I would not oppose public history and not public history. I would say that there are different levels of public engagement. It's not the same if you have, again, two or five people reading your article, or if you have one million visitors in your exhibition. So I'm thinking in terms of levels of public engagement. And I think uh, it's very important to acknowledge that not all historians are good at doing public history, right? It's the same as it's not because you're a good historian that you're a good teacher. I had plenty of you know, good, uh, good colleagues, good historians who cannot teach or are not done to teach, right? We all have those colleagues who are great researchers, but maybe they're not comfortable in the classroom. I think it's the same for public history. It's not because you're a good historian that you do good public history. You need to learn skills to do good public history, right? It's not because you're a good historian that you can communicate well, right? You need to learn oral speaking. You need to learn how to make a film. You need to learn how to make an exhibition. So you become a public history professional, right? So I would disagree with, with my colleague, uh, my Irish colleague saying that we, we don't need public history because we all do public history. No, we don't. So I would disagree. The, the second question uh, or criticism about public history is that it's impossible to have uh, one single or universal definition of public history. We cannot simply define public history. The argument is that there are so many different approaches of public history. There are so many different words, so many different profiles that it's impossible to have one definition of public history, or maybe there is no such thing as public history, right? Um, and, and those people also say that to impose one definition would be an act of supremacy, right? Imposing one definition. I, I would tend to agree that um, it's impossible to have one single definition of public history. That's why the International Federation for Public History, the IFPH, does not have one definition of public history because we don't want to impose one definition of public history. There are different approaches, different definitions of public history. There are different translations of public history. So I would agree that there is no one definition of public history. Going back to the translation issues, it's impossible to have one definition of public history because sometimes it's impossible to translate public and public history. You have a, a few examples here. I will go back to this later, but for example, the, the Brazilian uh, at the right uh, hand side of the slide, they translate in Historia Publica, which is the same in Spanish, Historia Publica. But uh, on the left hand side in Poland, it's very difficult in Polish to define public history. So my colleague, Joanna Vosden, called history in the public sphere. And that's the master that they have in Wroclaw in Poland. It's history in the public sphere, which is for me slightly different than, than public history. But we go back to that. Uh, and I want you to, to know that the Italian Association doesn't translate public history into Historia Publica. And we're going to see why. Um, so it's impossible to provide one definition, one single, single definition of public history. I would agree with that criticism. 
I think it's important that you find your own definition. And I, I want to mention the, the fantastic manifesto, the Italian manifesto for, for public history with some specific approaches of public history. And I think it's important that national associations, groups uh, provide their own definition of public history. Because now the Italian association and the manifesto helps other people, helps us, the International Federation, to make a, a richer definition of public history. It's also good to remind, for example, North Americans that public history is not only the 20th century, that antiquity, Middle Ages, can do public history, right? So this mixity of approaches is, I think, uh, the true answer to the criticism of we don't have one single definition of public history. That is good, not to have one definition. All right, moving to a slightly more difficult um, criticism. A friend of mine uh, looking at the Facebook page of the International Federation or the Facebook page of the Italian Association said to me, all right, public history is fine, but it looks like everything is becoming public history. And he said, do you agree? Is there a limit? Is everything public history? And I think it's it's a fair, fair comment that we need to, um, to uh, discuss. Because the argument is that uh, since we don't have one single definition of public history and we have a broad understanding or we have a tree, public history or, or metaphors, it leads to losing track of what's so special about public history. And I think that's a powerful criticism towards uh, a, a public history. But again, I would not oppose public history and non-public history. Often I'm asked, OK, what's public history and what's not public history? I would go back to what I said, defining different levels of public perspective, right? It's not, it's not because you're an historian and you go uh, on TV that you become you know, a public historian, right? I think you need a public perspective in your work. You need, you have different levels of historical thinking, right? So it's not, is it public history or not public history, right? You need to take into consideration the levels of historical thinking. Do you have sources? Do you have interpretation? Do you have research? So I, I prefer to think in terms of levels of public history than opposing academic and public history. But the question becomes, what are the shared values of public history? And, and that's something I, I believe we need to, to work on. Um, something maybe uh, useful for, for you, Serge, for tomorrow for the, the, the seminar on international public history. It's, it's a criticism that um, a friend of mine told me about that book that you see on the left that was published uh, two years ago. Uh, and I'm, write, I'm writing in the book, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm part of the problem, I would say. Uh, the, the book is What is Public History Globally? And the first title what was uh, What's uh, Global Public History? The change into what is public history globally, but the question remains, uh, are we talking about global public history? Are we talking about international public history? Are we talking about transnational public history? What are we talking about? And again, I think it's a difficult question. Uh, I would, the, the argument is that there is no such thing as a global public history. And I agree, there is no global public history. Uh, but what there is, is a global questioning. There's a global demand for, you know, for an answer, what is history today? What is what what is the role of, of an historian? There is a global discussion about that, right? And public history is only one of the answers, but there is a global questioning. Um, I also think that um, you know, public history uh, calls for democratic and, and public participation, right? Um, and, and that calls for broadening of public history. But that doesn't solve the, the question of, is it transnational or international? The federation, the international federation is called international federation, right? So are we talking about relations between nations, right? What are we talking about? Um, this is to, to give you an example, 
about this transnational versus international. And I would encourage you to read uh, C.H. Noiret's uh, chapter that I co-wrote about uh, international uh, public history in the global perspective. This is a map that the International Federation for Public History has uh, collaborated to, to make. It's about the different projects that document the COVID-19 memories, right? So you have a map of projects all, all around the world. So what we discover is that there are very, very few projects that go beyond the national, right? Only one of the very few examples out of 600 projects, I think you have like a dozen of projects that go beyond the national frame. Uh, one example is the Journal of the Plague Year, which is based in the US, but that connects with partners all around the world in a transnational way, because they're, they're questioning COVID memories, uh, regardless of the nation. But most of the projects in public history remain at the local or national level. There are very few transnational public history. Something, another question that I received uh, in Japan last year, something that I, I was surprised, I, would, I, I should admit, um, to, to, have, to be questioned about that. Um, I was criticized for um, contributing to a Western imperialism, saying that um, public history uh, is a model born in the United States that spread to Europe, uh, and it, which is very Western, Western oriented. Uh, so I, I was criticized for bringing a, a Western model to uh, uh, Japanese historians who would disagree with my conception of the public. And I think that's, a, that, that's an important question uh, that made me think about my understanding of public, my understanding of history. This is true that for uh, sometimes some people, especially uh, coming from the US, presented themselves as missionaries. We, we're bringing you one model. And I think that even Wesley Johnson who was uh, one of the fathers of public history in the US, sometimes adopted that, that, that view when he came to, to Europe in the 1980s, like bringing, bringing a model. So I think that there is something here. There's also the you know, language. English, uh, if you do a conference in public history, international conference, it's in English, right? And languages are important. There is a, a sort of English imperialism in the resources, in the books. So if you want to study, most of the resources are in English. So there is something. <clears throat> I would agree with, well, tend to agree with my, my Japanese uh, colleague who said that there, there is a sort of imperialism from the West. But I think I think there there's more than that uh, because if you look at <clears throat> excuse me the map of uh, it's it's a map that we have created about uh, programs of public history around the world so courses um, <clears throat> uh, teams lab research centers well obviously that there, there are in the some in in Europe uh, there are some in, in the U S in Canada but you see many in Latin America you see many in Australia, you see many, I mean, many some in, in Asia. So there is definitely a, a Western trope, but it's not a, a European uh, thing, right? And if you look at the national associations of public history, yes, you have some in the US, uh, you have one in Italy, one in Spain, but you also have one in Brazil and in Japan, right? So the, the public history in that case is, is wrote and is developed by Japanese colleagues. So I'm not bringing them public history. They develop their own understanding of public history. So I would say that the, the criticism of public history being Western oriented is, is, is a bit simplistic, although it makes us think about what public, what definition do we have of public? Because uh, as we will see, you cannot translate public into Japanese easily. Going even further into the criticism of public history, and I think, uh, right, I'm checking the time, I'm doing all right. Um, there is a, an argument that public history is only communication. I received, I, I should say, a very strong criticism from, um, from German colleagues. 
during a conference in, in Serbia. Their argument um, was that we are not working at the university in the history department to teach podcasts. They are not there to teach communication. They are not there uh, to teach uh, GIS and mapping. They are here to teach history. And in their mind, history, useful history, is the image that you see uh, at, the, at the left. And I'm not joking. They say that for them, you know, true history cannot be less than 600 pages because you need all the details, you need a full picture. And I'm sorry, I have a very definition of, of uh, what history is, because if you go back to the tree, that's the trunk. Yes, we need a trunk with a solid research, but public history goes beyond that. It's not only this. Critical methodology is important, but it's not enough. And I would even say that uh, when they criticize communication, when you write a, a PhD thesis, you're right. It's a form of communication. If you submit uh, a PhD thesis with, uh, you know, mistakes, misspelling, with a uh, uh, heavy style and, 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 and uh, full of, uh, you know, disorganized paragraphs, that would not look good, right? Communication is important, and we need to learn communication to work in the public space and with the public. So communication is important, but public history is not only communication. Slightly different. Even more difficult, uh, a question that comes back every now and then, um, sometimes a criticism saying that public history is simply um, collective memory. And I, I think we need to discuss the relations between history, memory, public history. Uh, the argument, and I'm quoting one argument in particular, came from a, a, a conference in Ecuador about public history and museums. And, and there was this uh, Ecuadorian colleague, historian, uh, very nice, uh, who, who made the keynote and compared uh, public history to memory studies. He was very inspired by uh, Nora, by Rousseau, the, the, the French leaders of the memory studies, among others. And he was saying that basically public history is, is uh, studying group memories. Uh, and I think that's an argument that we need to discuss because every time we organize conferences on public history, a good number of, of the presentations are about memories, right? Uh, a lot of time it's about historians studying memories, group memories through different medium, but still studying memories. And my personal view, and, and that's my view, um, is, is that public history and memory studies are different. We are not you know, reinventing the, the, the thing with a different world, but the same uh, practice. Public history is not memory studies. For me, public history is a process with a public perspective. It's a production. It's not studying memories. At least it could be like working with memories, right? It's different. Also, because if, you, if you're an historian and you study memory, you tend to oppose history and memory. And, and I believe that public history is doing something different. And I, I think we need to discuss that. Public history, um, I wouldn't say reconcile history and memory, but as a very specific relation with memory. To give you one example, this is an exhibition organized in uh, Minnesota in the US, in the United States, about the commemoration of the creation of, of the state of Minnesota. And uh, the museum asked people to submit ideas of people, places, and things that you can see on the right that shape the state. So the museum was asking people to send ideas, to send objects, to send memories. And those memories became part of the exhibition the exhibition that we can call a public history project. In the exhibition, you had the object, you had the memories from that person saying that memories was important for this and that, and you had this into a broader historical understanding. So let's 
to make it clear, to make it simple, the voice of the curator, the history and context. So you had the you know, memories and the voice of the curator, the expertise together, creating something different. It's not memories and history, it's something together. And I, I think that public history is not studying memories. Public history can give a voice to memory and can give a, a, a spot of memory to create something uh, bigger and broader than, than uh, simply history or memory. A uh, question that came up uh, two years ago uh, about public history, saying that there's no such thing as the public. Uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, curators, museum staff have been talking about that. There's no one public. Um, but what about public history? It was a, a conference organized uh, in, in Poland in 2019 called The Public in Public and Applied History. It, it was uh, I wasn't there, but um, you know the, the summaries were very very interesting. There was a discussion about um, not calling public history public history, but the, the the funny proposal from my my colleague in the International Federation, David Dean, who said, "Why not calling it public's history? Because there is no such thing as the public. There are publics." He, he was joking, but I think there is there is a discussion to have here. I agree that the public does not exist. It's not one thing, it's not one um, entity. You have publics, you have different audiences, you have different understandings of the past. And this variety of publics impact your research. Right? Because if you work in a museum and if you want to talk to the publics, plural, you may have different interpretations in your exhibition. Uh, on the left, you see a family visiting a museum, and obviously you can have some understanding for the kids, the children, understanding the past, for grown-ups, for historians, for tourists, for actors. Uh, so you may have different interpretations in one single, sorry, in one single uh, project. So yes, publics in public history, and we should be aware of the impact on this of this variety of public. Something that I uh, touch upon uh, at the beginning, uh, lost in translation. Um, one issue in international public history is how do you translate public history? For the, the, the article uh, that I published in 2018 on the rise of international public history in Spanish, we had a, a huge discussion with the translator about how should I translate public history in Spanish? Um, and the question is the same in French. Do you translate into histoire publique? Or um, during the conference in, in, in Japan, in Tokyo, the, trans, the translator asked me, I cannot, I mean, tell me, I cannot translate public history because public cannot be easily translated in Japanese. Right. And this, this is important. This is not a detail because sometimes it, it's impossible to translate uh, public from public history. You have various uh, examples here on, on the right in, in France, and that's something still debated. Uh, the trend seems to be to translate into histoire publique. The, the master in Paris, which is the only master of public history, is called histoire publique. In Spanish, the new association that was created last month translates into Historia Publica. As I said at the beginning, in, in Poland, they do not. Why? Because, and, and it's also the discussion about, uh, about France and to some extent Italy. When you say public, public in French, it has a connotation. It's connected to the welfare state and some people think, oh, Histoire Publique, that's the history of administration of the civil servants. No, it's not. Or you have the expression in French, femme publique, which is um, uh, well another name for fille facile, something preservative, something you don't want to use. So it's very difficult to translate into to French. The, the way that the Italian association did was to, to use um, the, the English name, the Association Italiana di Public History. 
And I think it's important, and, and I think that's a smart move because it it forces Italians, members, to think about uh, what public history is in the Italian uh, sphere uh, framework. And that forces us to think about not only translating, but having our own approach of uh, public history. Well, let's make it even more difficult. I think the most difficult issues that I've been dealing with is about uh, authority. Because one aspect of public history is the collaboration, working with people. But if you work with people, you question the definition of authority and expertise. And I think that that's the toughest uh, discussion we, we can have today on public history. And uh, one criticism about public history has been, has been about the concept of shared authority. Uh, developed by Michael Frisch, saying that well, the Christian would say that if you share authority, you deny Estonians uh, their expertise. So it's a strong criticism towards uh, public history that I want to spend some time upon. So as I said, uh, Michael Frisch published uh, his book in 1990, and he developed the, the concept of shared authority. And there have been multiple misunderstandings of the expression because it's been criticized for historians losing their authority, saying that, well, if you share authority, you know, why do we have historians? Or even people saying that, you know, share authority means that public history leads to relativism. Everything is equal, right? Uh, that's not my understanding of share authority. I believe that share authority encourages us, forces us to open the definition of authority. Right? It doesn't mean that uh, you historians do not have authority. It means that in doing public history, other people have some expertise too. Right? If you go back to the public history, uh, you remember you have the trunk, the historian, his, you know, doing research, but you also have archives, you also have communication branches, and those people have expertise too. If you take the example of an exhibition, you are an historian working in an exhibition, you're not the only one. You're gonna collaborate with a curator, you're gonna collaborate with a designer, you're gonna collaborate with a marketing officer, you're gonna collaborate with an education officer. They have expertise too, right? You don't do a, an exhibition by yourself, so you share authority with them. And if you don't, well, you may end up in, in a very poor and bad exhibition. So we do share authority uh, anyway. Uh, that, that is the tree I, I was referring to. You have multiple actors with whom you share authority, right? It doesn't mean that East wants to, it doesn't mean that they lose their authority. It means that you have multiple expertises, right? So you have expert designer, curators, video producers, if you, an historian, you want to make a, a documentary film, you're going to work with someone with video editing skills, an expert, right? I think the problem comes when you ask historians to share authority with the public and publics. Um, and again, there are different levels. In public history, historians can share authority with people who know history, local historians, amateur historians, even if they don't have a position in university. So those people know things too. Uh, so we can share uh, some authority with them. You can also share authority with people who have a living expertise, right? Those can be people who went through the event that you're studying. So a witness, for example, that you interview, you kind of share authority with him or her, or people who have living traditions. And here I want to give the example of uh, the indigenous populations who become curator. Uh, native population in, in Canada and the US, where I know more examples, participate in exhibitions, for example, as you can see on the slide. They have some expertise too. They can bring their understanding of the objects, right? So, and, and they're part of the publics. So there are ways you can share expertise, historians, curators, uh, publics. It doesn't mean that everybody has expertise, but it means that we have to broaden the definition of expertise. 
I'm not saying top right. I'm not saying that uh, all expertise are on the same level. I'm not saying that everything is equal, but I'm saying that an historians have and should share authority with a curator and people who know about the topic, right? I'm not saying that all interpretations are equal. You know, some are uh, not true or some are less informed than others, right? Share authority doesn't mean equal interpretations of the past. The whole point of public history is to provide tools for collaboration, to construct history together. And I, I would even say that public history, the role of public historian, people who do public history, is not to share a product, but to share the process, the tools, how to study a source, how to use a source. So as you can see, share authority is one, uh, and it's, it's by no mean a, a final and definite answer. It's just my answer to this question. Another question, difficult question, is um, who owns the past? I've had this question a couple of times. People asking me, since you share authority, then who owns the past? Who can decide what's the true uh, interpretation of the past? Who have authority to define the past? And again, that's that's a difficult question. Uh, I don't know who owns the past. Uh, I don't want, I mean, I, who am I to decide who owns the past? And I even think that it's a difficult um I mean, question, it's, it's a dangerous uh, path. To, to talk about that, there is this famous example, uh, the Enolage exhibition in 1995, the project at the Smithsonian Museum in the US. The exhibition was supposed to talk about uh, the atomic bomb in 1945 in Japan. Um, you, you have a quote from one curator saying, and I can, I can read it, uh, top left, how do we remember a war that we won? Do you want to do an exhibit to make veterans feel good? Or do you want an exhibition that will lead our visitors about the consequences? I don't think we can solve. The, it, it's important because um, due to the pressure of veteran groups who say that it's not possible to question the bomb because it's not patriotic. Because of that pressure, the museum had to, the, the director had to resign and the, the exhibition was cancelled. So the question that who owns the past? Do veterans own the past? Do historians own the past? Do museums own the past? I think that's, his, that, that's a ownership of the past is a dangerous question. Uh, that's not how we should uh, conceive history and the path. Because if we talk about ownership of the past, then uh, you can justify memory laws and state control or censorship. Here are just a few examples of memory laws that have been passed in, in France in 2005 about colonization. In China in 2015, there, there, there is a law that prevents people, including historians, to challenge uh, leaders like Mao Zedong, or the law in Poland in 2018 that uh, tried to criminalize the historical interpretation of Polish helping uh, the Nazi, right? So the state saying we own the past, this is how you should interpret the past. So owning the past is not, uh, I think, the proper way we should, um, we should talk about authority in, in the past because public history is based on, on core values. And that's something that's been in the news recently about political pressure. I think there's a need for public history to uh, support freedom of research, freedom of interpretation, and the possibility to be critical with the past, right? Because if you lose that right to be critical with the past, then there is no point of having history at all. So who owns the past? I would say no one. I, I think the most important aspect is to uh, keep that uh, right to be critical about interpretations of the past. A question, uh, have a few left. Uh, a question, a uh, difficult question that I, I got about objectivity, saying that public history is compromising objectivity because it includes multiple partners that have different objectives. 
right? So if you collaborate with people who do not care about is it true or not, you're you know, compromising history. It's a very powerful uh, criticism. The argument is that history is based on objectivity, but because public history is a collaboration with different partners who do not have objectivity as a then public history is doomed to fail. And it reminds me of the, you know, the joke about my cat has four legs, my dog has four legs, so my dog is a cat. Um, I, I think the principle is wrong. Uh, the principle is wrong to oppose one objective history versus multiple memories, right? Having said that, that's true, then when you collaborate with, with some groups and some people, you face some ethical issues. When you work as an historian with a community that want to celebrate the past and do not want to talk about the difficult aspect, you have ethical issues, right? I think it depends the role of the historian in the project. There is no one single solution. I think there are some issues we need to talk about. If you work, for example, as a consultant, for a private company, and I can use my own example. Uh, last year, I was working with a, a beer company, a brewery. I was helping them to create their archives. I was also helping them to create their, their you know, uh, brewery history. And we had to go through uh, some, you know, not difficult, but some discussion, a memorandum of agreement and a contract because I didn't want to simply celebrate their history. I wanted to bring some context. I wanted to bring understanding of the past. And sometimes it can be difficult when the company doesn't want to talk about specific things. So we, uh, in my training, I propose to, for instance, to learn about contract agreements and memorandum because we need to set up the rules of the collaboration with, with partners and clients. Historians working with uh, producers. Uh, this is an example of, of uh, Zeman Davis, famous for uh, historical consulting for the movie Retour de Martin Guerre. The problem is that when historians you know, are advisor for films or documentary films, they may have very different objectives. The producers may want to you know, make money or to, have, uh, to increase the number of views. Historians may not have the same objectives, right? And, and uh, producers may want you know, visually appealing sources, uh, testimonies. So Easterns have to adapt to a specific type of source. So you have different objectives for the historians and the producers. But Nathan and Zeman Davis had this very uh, clever answer about, you know, is history biased in documentary film or fiction? For her, she said that what mattered for her the most was to provide a general historical understanding of the past to the audience. Even if some details were not true, but if the historians can succeed in bringing some historical understanding of the situation in the 16th century, uh, then you win. I, 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 think, I think there are, there are you know, not I wouldn't call it compromises, but um, collaboration to discuss between historians, producers, clients, and so on. And finally, I do think that historians need to learn the skill to make history and public history themselves. If you if you fed up with um, movies, documentary films that are inaccurate, make your own film, make your own documentary. Um, this is an example of a documentary I, I made uh, three years ago about the history of, of French in, in Louisiana. I had to learn how to make a documentary film. But if you do that, historians are not only consultants, they can become producers. And to do that, you need video editing skills, you need interviewing skills, but I think that can solve partly some of those issues. I'm gonna move away from that because there are, uh, uh, Marcello, can I have like five more minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Um, because I have two tough questions I would like to, uh, to try to answer. So, what about conflicting interpretations? If historians collaborate with partners, or if you make history public, you're going to have conflicting interpretation of the past. People would disagree about the past. And that, that's a 
fair criticism towards public history. So how do we deal with conflicting interpretations? Uh, or as my Korean friend asked me, does public history have a way to deal with reconciliation? Right? So how do you deal with conflicting views of the past? I don't have, I don't have a single solution. I don't have a magical solution. Um, I think that um, the opposition between true or not true is important, but it's not enough. I think what matters the, the most for public history is to have a framework of construction. And I want to show you some examples of what I mean by that. How do you deal with people who say that um, in the US that slavery was not that bad, for example? I've had those kind of people. Um, so the question is, how do you deal with, with what we could call a myth, right? Uh, I, I think public history can help uh, bring a framework that contextualize the past. I think that's a, that's key for history, for historians. We should not lose that, right? But we also need to ask people, how do you know what you know? Because history is different from opinion. How do you know what you know? To, as an example, there was this um, person who said that, um, oh, in my family, we, you know, we, we had slaves. And, and slaves were happy. Uh, so how do you deal with that statement? And, and the picture is uh, about the myth of uh, happy slaves. And, and slavery was not about happiness. But how do you deal with that people? Um, so you can confront that person and say, that's not true, right? And you disagree and then nothing happens. Or you can, that's one way of dealing with that, you can also work with that person. How do you know that? I mean, family stories. Uh, what are the evidence? What does that mean? Or if you have one evidence, can we contextualize the source? It's not because you find somewhere once that, oh, my slave was happy, that you should not be critical with that, right? So I think it's very important to have a framework in which we bring people into making history, thinking about why they know what they know, right? And we may not convince them that, you know, have slavery was not have a happy slave, but I think having this framework of interpretation can help. I think an example is uh, about Northern Ireland. How do you deal with people who have different understanding of one single event? For example, the Battle of the Boyne, 1690. For many Protestants, that was the victory of William, the victory of democracy. For many Catholics, no, it was a step in the religious discrimination against Catholics. So they have different and opposite interpretation. One way that was used in a public history project was to bring that event into a broader context. Again, contextualization. And in 1690, the battle was not that much about, you know, those Irish Protestant or Catholics. It was a battle between Louis XIV and the Grand Alliance. It was a European diplomacy battle. The path was more complex than a binary opposition between Protestants and Catholics. You had multiple meanings, and, uh, and the, the path was complex. If you, if you create that framework in which the complexity of the past is deconstructed, uh, I, I think you, you, can, you can get somewhere. And um, one you know, final example is about uh, some new media that adopt uh, a non-linear understanding of the past, right? Some transmedia, especially digital media, use um, uh, storytelling or web documentary to provide multiple understanding of the past, right? Evidence, testimonies, different point of views, but also a historical context. This is one example from, uh, from Gaza and the very controversial understanding of what's happening in Gaza. And I believe that new media, web documentary in particular, when you can have uh, multiple uh, sessions, multiple interpretations, can be very useful. Um, and, and I will finish, that's going to be my last uh, slide, because I want to keep time for the discussion. For historians, it means that you can have different interpretations of the past. One easy example is that the First World War you may have a different interpretation if you look at the national narratives or the everyday life in town or through the eyes of ethnic minorities. It doesn't change what happened, 
but the interpretation may be different depending on the level and scope that you're studying. Sarah Lloyd and Julia Moore uh, called that the sedimented histories. It means that different histories can be together, can be connected and not uniform, right? She said that it provides ways to have different interpretations and make people think about uh, their connection, how they, they differ and how they, they work together. I think this is a, a, a key aspect of public history. Uh, I want to, well, I had other, I had other discussions like is public history leftist? Um, is public history more on the left than on the right? But I, you know, I don't really have time to discuss that today. Um, how do you deal with supremacists and, and monuments? Uh, do you, can you share authority with um, white supremacists and people you disagree with? I think it's an important question, and we can we can discuss that in the, in the questions. And finally, is public history neoliberal? Uh, that's an argument that I had as, as well. Uh, universities trying to develop public history because they're uh, neoliberal. So a few, as you can see, the, the field is growing as the questions are. And I think we, we need to discuss more about those issues, about the role of historians in the, the impact of working with people. So I'm going to stop my uh, sharing my screen and uh, we'll uh, hopefully ha have questions and comments. Thank you for your attention. Grazie, grazie a Thomas. Uh, e... Io direi che adesso noi possiamo aprire la fase delle domande eh, da parte appunto di, dei presenti. Utilizziamo se possibile eh, l'alzata la, di mano, the hand, stand up your hand, eh, 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 e, e soprattutto eh, vi chiederei di eh, raccogliere le domande in inglese e in italiano in maniera indifferente in modo che poi il professore Coman possa fare una replica finale a tutte le domande, in modo da dare un quadro generale a, tutto, diciamo, a tutta la discussione. Quindi, start, start questions. Già ce n'è una, penso una prima, vediamo, uh, eh, di Enrica Salvatori. Prego. Eh, come facciamo a raccogliere Marcello, visto che non c'è attiva la chat? Non ho capito. Non posso con la mano, aprire. con la mano, con la mano ah, e, no. e parlate. Con okay. la mano e parlate. Ok, then I, I speak. Hi, Toma. Uh, uh, I have to say that I used your uh, tree, uh, public history tree, in my lesson this year. I found it uh, very useful. And uh, but uh, actually, I use it. Uh, uh, I, I teach digital public history, as you know. Uh, but uh, uh, I use it uh, um, to describe the uh, the work of the historian itself. Okay, not uh, the public historian, not the digital public historian. And normally, I I, I say to my students that. Uh, Maybe the, the traditional historian of the tree is more like a cypress. And uh, for, the pub, di, for the digital public historian, uh, are more, uh, uh, is more like, a, uh, I don't know, the, the name is willow cypress. So, um, cypress sol, sol, sol uh, in, in, in France, le, 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 le tree qui, uh, uh, um, avec les... Oh, do you know what what I mean? Okay, the the, the tree the tree that is uh, with the branch that that uh, touch the the ground. Okay, uh, so everything is connected. Is is really difficult to to define what is roots, what is trunk, what is branches. Um, so. Um, Maybe oh, oh, okay. We need. Uh, I, I agree with you, you. With you, we need uh, some sort of metaphor. We need to understand uh, better uh, uh, our our job, and uh, maybe this large amount of um, of um, branches uh, and. Non mi ricordo come si dice foglia, ma mi verrà. 
um, leaves leaves uh, is 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 good to understand that our projection toward the public the, the the fact that we are projected toward the public the the, the publics but actually is is just the same i i don't i don't see now uh, the real difference only in the shape of this uh, of this tree. And so uh, this is my my uh, my observation, and I mm, I, I, I I agree with all uh, the the other things you have said. Okay. Grazie, Enrica. Um, e passiamo la parola ad Hernán Rodríguez. Sì, buonasera. Farò la mia domanda in italiano. In realtà sono due. La prima è, mh, riguarda quel senso, diciamo, globale della storia pubblica. E, mh, se c'è pure il rischio di, ad esempio, nazionalizzarla, cioè non solo di inserirla all'interno dei discorsi sulla memoria, ma anche di, diciamo, rinchiuderla in, in questione della storia o delle storie nazionali, secondo i posti in cui si fa, se la Spagna, se la Francia, se il Brasile, eccetera. E poi, in un secondo momento, il rapporto è per la decisione di scegliere le metafore. Se in questo contesto c'è anche eh, qualche rapporto o qualche che approfondimento partendo ad esempio dalla filosofia del linguaggio o dagli studi linguistici eh, sull'utilizzo delle metafore. E, è questo. E grazie mille della presentazione, è davvero molto interessante. Ok, Arnan, grazie. Eh, la parola a Serge Noiré. Ecco, scusate. Eh, prima di tutto eh, grazie davvero Thomas perché questo fresco che hai, eh, sei riuscito a tranciare in un'ora e venti è una cosa assolutamente complessa e completa che poi ci pone tante domande. Io eh, le voglio fare in italiano ovviamente perché tu capisci l'italiano e mi puoi rispondere in inglese. Eh, a proposito di quattro parole, cioè che poi tu hai approfondito e che, eh, sulle quali secondo me ci vuole anche un, un altro po' di riflessione, eh, vedendo le tante interpretazioni che ci sono attorno a questi termini. Primo, internazionale. Allora, internazionale, eh, esiste una public history internazionale, eh, abbiamo scritto nel nostro saggio eh, dell'Oxford Handbook, che eh, lo è quando è locale, nel senso che è sempre locale o sotto il livello della nazione, ma che ha delle metodologie, dei, delle questioni, delle domande, dei modi per arrivare a produrre processi pratiche che sono simili in paesi come l'Australia, l'Italia, eh, Canada o il Sud, il Sud Africa. Dunque, secondo me questo è qualcosa che possiamo eventualmente considerare come acquisito a livello internazionale. Poi la seconda parola, secondo me, è, è memoria. Memoria, anche sempre in questo saggio che abbiamo fatto, abbiamo eh, detto che la memoria è un, eh, un oggetto che viene utilizzato, studiato e, e messo in ordine dalla storia, ma anche dai public historian. Cioè, i public historian hanno le memorie individuali e eh, collettive, ci fanno ovviamente eh, buon uso all'interno dei progetti che realizzano e come, e che, come vanno a... Eh. E dunque non c'è un vero conflitto tra memoria e storia nella public history. Mentre c'è molto di più, secondo me, nella storia tradizionale. Cioè noi abbiamo attraverso i nostri processi di autorità condivisa oppure anche eh, di eh, utenti, cioè, eh, contenuti generati dagli utenti che sono memoriali, che sono familiari, che sono testimonianze, che permettono ovviamente di costituire un approccio a una comunità, 
sono inerenti alle pratiche della pubblica storia. Dunque io non vedo questo gran conflitto, il grande problema del, della memoria che viene evacuata come qualcosa di altro dagli storici quando si tratta di pubblica storia. E poi c'è il termine che hai molto usato, e forse lì è l'unica cosa con la quale potrei ti sentire un po', perché io condivido assolutamente tutto quello che hai detto. E ti devo dire che molte delle domande che hai avuto sono le domande che abbiamo continuamente, eh, ma è molto bello come l'hai fatto per farci capire eh, quali sono eh, ovviamente gli interrogativi che giustamente le persone, gli storici oppure altre persone, altri professionisti hanno quando si parla di public history. È la parola past, il passato. Allora, su questo io... Eh, Penso che eh, non esiste il passato, esiste soltanto la visione che noi abbiamo attraverso una ricostituzione storica o una memoria di quello che è la nostra interpretazione del passato. Forse è quello che hai detto eh, poi dopo, ma utilizzando, lo utilizzano molto gli americani il termine di past come se fosse qualcosa di tangibile, di spiegabile, di costituito e di presente, ma secondo me non esiste. Ecco, questo è, su questo vorrei avere. E poi l'ultimo eh, punto è quello che giustamente hai detto a proposito di la storia, la public history e solo comunicazione. Eh, io andrei più lontano ancora perché in Italia molti, eh, molti pensano, per esempio, e questo se dovesse mettere su una domanda critica che ci viene soprattutto in Italia, è che eh, la public history è la comunicazione della eh, conoscenza accademica e dunque che serve soltanto a far conoscere ad altri pubblici fuori dall'università quelle che sono eh, le scoperte scientifiche degli storici. Ecco, questo per me è una domanda eh, che ovviamente eh, tu ci hai risposto attraverso tutto quello che hai detto, ma è, è lì al centro, sul tavolo di quello che sono le nostre preoccupazioni, perché poi in molti libri anche scritti da persone importanti o da giornaliste ritorna sempre questa idea. Grazie ancora, Antonio. Grazie Serge, la parola a Chiara Ottaviano. Ciao Tomà, è, è, è stato veramente bello sentirti, una bellissima lezione che condivido in grandissima parte. Eh, per questo, giusto per essere, per, vediamo se poi è vero, ecco. Allora, eh, mi sembra di capire che anche per te essere public historian, prima di tutto bisogna essere degli storici, perché altrimenti non puoi avere quell'autorità che ti pone in modo diverso rispetto eh, agli altri con cui collabori, con cui partecipi, con cui costruisci anche delle ricerche. No? Delle cose. Quindi bisogna avere quel, quel tipo di competenza che è degli storici, che è quello di che cosa? Eh, anche avere a che fare con le fonti, che le fonti siano la memoria, le, il documento scritto, le fonti orali, eh, la, 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 la lettera conservata in famiglia, le metodologie no, che abbiamo imparato eh, devono essere messe in campo. No, dico questo perché ogni tanto c'è un po' di confusione su questa possibilità di fare il salto, no? <ride> cioè di, eh, siamo bravi eh, a comunicare, a, a, far, a coinvolgere, a fare, cioè, però poi magari... Eh, non abbiamo eh, veramente le basi metodo di metodologia della ricerca storica su via, è, è una discussione che si fa intensamente. Ecco, poi per il resto mi sembra eh, di essere veramente d'accordo con te anche in questo, cioè in realtà, e eh, 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 ovviamente sono d'accordo con chi ha parlato prima di me, con Serge, in particolare su quest'ultimo aspetto rispetto alla comunicazione, perché se è vero che, che, che devono sapere comunicare, è anche vero che noi abbiamo, dovremmo avere come public research qualche capacità in più anche di fare ricerca in modo innovativo coinvolgendo eh, quel, quel tipo di partecipazione eh, appunto di fare diciamo, 
la storia in pubblico e con il pubblico, eh, quindi con una capacità di coinvolgere, e, e lì è un banco di prova complicato, e lì c'è un'autorità condivisa nel senso, non nel senso di partecipazione, cioè quella, quella ricerca è fatta da persone che, come hai detto tu, che portano anche saperi diversi e competenze diverse nella costruzione del prodotto finale, no? che è un prodotto di storia. Grazie. Grazie Chiara. Eh, visto che non c'è al momento nessun altro in coda, vorrei io aggiungermi con una, una piccolissima riflessione, se, sperando appunto uh, di, di, cioè, di, non alla, di, di, di consentire poi a, a, a Tomà di, di rispondere a tutti <coughs> e, e velocemente. Um, perché uh, sì, io con, condivido ciò che dice, che ha detto Sergio alla fine sul passato, però è anche vero che, um, che forse uno dei nostri ruoli dentro, uh, dentro uh, le dinamiche uh, globali di come, di come la, il passato si sta come narrazione impossessando del, diciamo, del senso comune della storia. Io credo appunto quando gli americani parlano di missione, no? come tu ci hai ben ricordato, quando questo penso sia anche molto legato al loro modo di affrontare le tematiche pubbliche legate alla religiosità civile americana, no? al fatto di sentirsi sempre pronti gli americani ad impegnarsi nel pubblico e per il pubblico per la questione della nazione, dell'America. No? E, e credo che Uh, credo che questo aspetto della missione possa, uh, possa essere ritradotto diciamo, fuori dall'America in un impegno civile degli storici, un, un impegno nella società, in un ruolo sociale del, degli storici e questo uh, può determinare anche un nuovo approccio a, a questa dimensione di comunicazione e passato, perché secondo me comunicazione della storia e passato sono due termini che vanno coniugati insieme, perché molto di, del passato, del, raccon del racconto della storia che noi chiamiamo passato, è in sostanza una comunicazione della storia che in incorpora, che mette dentro anche tutto un discorso sull'immaginario della storia, sulle rappresentazioni della storia. E queste rappresentazioni della storia in una, in una dimensione in cui eh, la comunicazione della storia diventa non più uh, sharing authority, ma shared authority, cioè autorità già condivisa, perché condivisibile nel digitale e nei social network, ci pone di fronte alla necessità di um, vedere e di intervenire, di intervenire diciamo, come... I can't hear you, Marcello. Eccomi, scusatemi, ma eh, se ne diciamo, a, eh, velocemente chiudo. A comprendere ciò che c'è dietro la comunicazione della storia. Spesso la comunicazione della storia non è neanche più uso pubblico, diventa una, un elemento di dibattito del pubblico e nel pubblico dal quale gli storici sono completamente esclusi e si costruisce quindi un immaginario della storia, una rappresentazione della storia che colonizza il senso pubblico e, e spesso questo senso pubblico tratta la storia e gli storici, anche quando sono public historian, come degli intrusi, come quelli che vogliono riportare l'autorità della storia in un mondo che si è liberato Diciamo della casta, diciamo così, ma questo è un termine italiano, cioè del, del, diciamo degli scienziati che vogliono imporre necessariamente la loro visione. Non, non so se, se sono stato chiaro, perché facendo la domanda in italiano potrebbe essere stato un po' complicato, però a te le risposte a tutti quanti voi. Grazie. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, Hernan, Serge, uh, Enrica, I'm um, going to try to answer um, them all. Uh, Enrica, the, the, the tree, um, I, I agree with you that having the leaves 
uh, Le Fourier is important because th there is always, uh, I think, in, in doing public history, uh, uh, a public perspective. And, and knowing that your history, if you're a historian, you know, that your history will be used by, by, by someone and uh, different publics, different uses, also is important to in, in your process. So the leaves are not simply the end of the process, they, they are connected to the branches, the, the trunk and, and the roots. So I agree with you. Um, and then uh, the, the, the risk of, of national national public history, uh, that, that's, that's true. Um, I, I see your point. Um, I think the, the, the reason why we have Spanish, Italian, uh, Brazil, Japanese, is is simply to organize networks. Um, I think it's important what the, the Italian Association has done to gather people. Uh, I think this is a very logistic approach, but this is this is useful because it creates a, a space of discussion. I agree we should not uh, you know have only national groups and the, the, the role of the international association is to mix you know, Italians with, with, with Portuguese, with Japanese um, for discussions, and we discuss about one topic and not one nation. I, I see your point, and I think we're trying to be aware of that. Uh, thank you, Anand, for the, the, the mention of the linguistic uh, and the language aspect of, of the metaphor. The, there is so much about the, the, the concept of the, of the metaphor and what it implies. Um, that I, I should read about. Um, so far, I only use the metaphor as a, as a teaching tool, but I agree with you, there is, there is a methodology, there is a concept, there is a philosophy behind it, um, especially the tree, because it connects to, for example, genealogy, and then it can become problematic because you have the roots and identity issues. So I agree, uh, I, I need to um, develop more uh, the theory of the, the metaphor. Uh, Serge, uh, where to start? Uh, international and local? Yes. Um, I would say that global is a beautiful concept. It's not always used in public history projects. Um, I agree it's important to, to connect local and other levels of interpretation. For example, um, using family history, family objects, and bringing a broader context is a form of local uh, work. Uh, I agree it, it's important. Um, it's not always used, but that's something we should support. Yes. Um, memory. Your question about memory and saying that in public history, if I understand correctly, in public history, there is no, there is no straight opposition between history and memory. Um, yes, I agree. That's my point. But many colleagues who uh, do not do public history have this very different view of seeing memory and history are different. We study memory, history is objective. So it's also a talk for them to show that uh, having memory and history together is not impossible. But yeah, I, I agree with you, we have the same uh, point. The past. Uh, thank you, uh, the, the past. Uh, the reason what the reason maybe we, we mentioned the past more in, in the US. The reason why I do it is I want people to understand that history is not the past, right? Uh, that it's not because they see something about the past that it's true. And very often publics confuse history and the past. They say, well, this is written, this is the past. I would say no. I think we reach the past through history. If you say that the past does not exist, I'm afraid that's going to be uh, a post-structuralist approach and they're going to lose my audience. If I say that the past doesn't exist, we only have interpretation. I would say that we cannot reach the past, right? We can only interpret the past. But if I delete the past, I'm going to lose my audience. Uh, so I, I prefer to say that the, the past, history, and there's a process, a construction to try to interpret the past. 
Uh, but I don't think we, we disagree. I think we have. No, no, mate. The, the idea is that the, the, the memory that the people have is their conception of the past. So yeah. you have memories and. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree with I agree, I agree totally with with you. Uh, and we that goes back to the question of we cannot we, we only reach the path through through memory, through sources, and there is a production together to discuss the past. So I, I think we, we agree on that. Communication, that's a big, uh, it's a big topic. Um, I, obviously, I don't think that public issue is only communication. I think for, for me, uh, uh, public participation is, is very important and it goes beyond communication. And I think if I go back to the tree, there is no communication without uh, archives. There is no communication without historical research. In other words, there is no branches without the trunk. So I would never disconnect communication from the trunk or from the roots. I think the beauty of public history is that it connects communication, so YouTube channel, for example, with research interpretation archives. The more we connect the roots, the, the trunk and the branches, I think the stronger public history is. But I, I see your point about uh, people saying that public history is merely and only communication. It's not. And we should fight to say that public history, and it goes back to what Chiara was saying, is also with methodology, sources, interpretation. We should share that process instead of simply communicating it. Um, I'm trying to uh, see what I wrote. Yes. And, and communication is also important because it, it impacts the research, right? Because if we have, if you choose a medium, for example, uh, an exhibition, it, it may impact how you're going to do research, what types of source you're going to use. If you know you're going to make a film, it's going to impact your research because you, you will want to have visual sources you want you may want to have interviews so the communication also has an impact on the research and and, and that's something we should uh, think um, about and but public history is not only vulgarization or divulgation it's more than that I don't really like that term because it's um, I think it's too uh, limiting in, in 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 our definition of public history um, Chiara, yes, uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, yes, uh, sources, research uh, is important. And, you know, if we talk about public historians, I don't really use the term public historians, I don't really like it. Um, but if we talk about historians who do public history, they do research too. Uh, my, my, my students, when they do an exhibition, they, they do research and they have a methodology. So it's very important to to say uh, that public history is again not only uh, communication; it has some some research part. Um, Marcello, um, you, your point about communication and also the something you mentioned about the, the civic the civic role of historians. It's something we we've been talking uh, with Enrica when she she had her, her presentation about public history in Italy. We talk about the the third mission, but what's the role of University as well. It's not only communication, it's not only training. There is more discussion about the third mission of university, something um, very widespread in, in Anglo Saxon uh, universities who want to have this outreach and engagement. And I think when we do public history in universities, the, the topic is also about what's the link between university and communities, groups, people around us. What's the, the, the job of the university? It's not only training. Yes, it, it is training. It's not only research. It's also about helping local or regional community to, to do history and to make history. I think this concept of third mission, engagement, um, civic role, I wouldn't say leading, but you know, helping and working with the co-production is, is more and more important and, and raises some, some questions about shared authority but something that uh, is very timely and something we need to talk about when we want to develop 
public history in university. It's not only about training, it's not only about funding, it's also about what the role of universities will be in the next 10, 50 uh, years or so. Um, I believe I believe I have tried to answer them all. Did I forget some some questions or are there new uh, questions, Marcello? No, hai risposto a tutti, eh, non hai dimenticato nulla. E a questo punto, diciamo, sono, diciamo, siamo arrivati esattamente alle due ore previste di, di seminario. E ringraziando te, ringraziando tutti i partecipanti, tutti gli amici che hanno voluto anche farti domande e fare osservazioni su questo bel seminario. Ho ricevo già qualche, eh, qualche, qualche richiesta di poter avere, se possibile, le tue slide per poter fare qualche lezione anche sulla base di questa, di questa bella diciamo, seminario che tu ci hai lasciato oggi. E sperando di vederci tutti molto presto, fighting the, the COVID, <ride> diciamo, eh, ci, ci, ci salutiamo e ci vediamo con alcuni di noi lunedì ad un nuovo appuntamento dell'Associazione Italiana di Public History. Un abbraccio, grazie. Thank you, grazie. Thank you all. Yes, I will send you my slides and I will, some, I will see some of you tomorrow for the Festival of International Public History. Certo, domani, domani infatti tu sarai, sarai in, in collegamento virtuale con gli amici del Salento al, al, diciamo, al, diciamo, al convegno internazionale di Public History. Serge Mare. Lo ricordiamo, qui c'è stata anche la Giuliana Iurlano con noi e un abbraccio a tutti e grazie ancora Tomà del tuo tempo e della tua bella lezione. Thank you Marcello. Grazie, ciao Ciao, ciao. ciao grazie. Grazie, arrivederci.